Before we begin this, uh, I'm going to say this, uh, I guess mostly for your benefit, right? Um, so there's a final project for this class. And depending on how I feel about content this week, this may be the last week of new content for the class. The remaining time will be uh, for you guys to work on that final project and pick one out. Uh, and what I think I like the idea of is final exam time slot being time for talks. And so that means that I'll want no two different people to be talking about the same topic unless they coordinate with each other to make sure they're not doing the same thing for their talk. I guess that means like between the two of them they could give a 40 minute talk, one person doing an introductory portion, the other person doing an unindepth portion. Uh, <coughs> yeah, keep that in mind. Have you guys thought about final projects at this point? Yeah. Joan apparently has. Okay. Um, yeah, there are some suggestions online. If people want to come talk to me at some point about ideas for final projects, give suggestions. Um, all right, so. Uh, Maybe here's one of them, just uh, for free on the spot. So you know how like the sum of negative one to the n divided by n? That sum converges, but not absolutely. Uh, and it turns out that you can rearrange the terms of this sum, hitting all of the same numbers, but just in a different order, to turn that sum into any number you want, all plus infinity or minus infinity, or something which just doesn't converge whatsoever. So there's one possible theorem, the, the rearrangement theorem for conditionally convergent series. And I can suggest GUI sources to you know, learn about that stuff to give that talk, slash write that paper. Cool, so let's begin. So, today's the day that we're actually going to prove the result that I promised we would, that differential equations have solutions. And before we do that, let's just to remember some of the things that we've done so far. So let's see. Uh, if I give you two metric spaces x and y, what is c of x comma y? sense in any metric space, so that makes sense. Uh, and the whole point of that is this space is again a metric space with the supremo metric. itself have fixed points. Namely that contractive functions have fixed points. What does it mean to say uh, I think there's a contraction? So if you have some map t from a metric space x to itself, what does it mean to 
call that such a, such a thing a contraction? is a contraction from a metric space to itself, then there exists a unique input x in that metric space which satisfies that t of x is equal to x for all x. None of that, well, I guess this at least has to do with functions, so maybe you believe that has to do with solving differential equations because the solution will be a function. But maybe this other stuff doesn't necessarily sound like it relates to, me to, 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 differ to differential equations at this point. But let's explore how it does. <coughs> so uh, more specifically, I'm going to talk about solving initial value problems. An initial value problem just consists of a differential equation, something of the form f prime of x is something depending on what x is and what f of x is with an initial condition, f of x0 is equal to y0. <coughs> and a solution to that is just some function little f which satisfies those properties on some interval containing x0. That's all. Um, you guys know some of the techniques you know for solving differential equations? I mean, sometimes you can just like integrate both sides. Uh, sometimes you can do separation of variables and then integrate both sides. Uh, you know how to solve linear equations. Um, yeah, in fact, you can solve any degree linear differential equation. As always, you can solve a polynomial equation. You ask for from alpha to Okay, there's another technique. You ask for from alpha to solve this differential equation for you. Numerically <laughs> solve. Um, and it's going to do something like a reverse method or maybe a longer time. Which, um, I think that's one of the optional topics in Calc 2. Do you guys say the reverse method in Calc 2? Yes. Okay. Euler's method, uh, if you like, the uh, overall simplified version of it is a differential equation is like saying that at every point x comma y, if the function goes to that point, it should have that tangent vector. So you just go some short distance in that direction, and then you check again which way you should go. Then you put those together and say, well, if I take these little lengths to be little enough, I should approximate a solution to the differential equation. Well, I'm going to cut it something like that, but you look for high degree polynomials instead of linear functions. Wow. So all of those are well and good, but they seem really specific. If you see this type of equation, this is how you find a solution. Uh, let's not try to solve differential equations right now. Let's try to show that differential equations have solutions. Uh, and in fact, this existential proof can be interpreted as an instruction for how to build the solution. Uh, let's, let's see it. Um, so here is how I will do it. I'm going to study an operator that goes from the space of continuous functions to the space of continuous functions. So notice I haven't specified what these two things are. Space of continuous functions from something to something to the space of continuous functions from something to something, given by this formula. If phi is, well, I guess it should be a real valued function defined on an interval. T of phi will be defined to be the integral from x0 up to x of f of t comma phi of t, dt, 
plus the uh, initial value y0. Um, and so I can, this is maybe a, a false step into like studying operators on function space. And if you like the philosophy is if you want to understand the real number line, you have to understand functions on the real number line. But that means if you want to understand functions on the real number line, you have to understand the set of functions on the set of functions of the real, on the real number line. And that's what we're doing here. We're studying a function that goes from the space of functions to the space of functions. In order to avoid calling everything a function, I'll call that an operator. So an operator is just a function defined on function space. Okay, but that maybe looks a little bit related to that differential equation in that integration has something to do with differentiation. Well, here's the claim which says that it definitely has something to do with it. Uh, a function f solves that IVP if and only if it is a fixed point for that operator. And the proof is going to be super direct. Let's suppose first that f is a fixed point for this operator t. We need to check that it so that solves the uh, initial value problem. do that. So that means I need to know what f of, let's see, okay, so since it's a fixed point, f of x is the same thing as t of f of x. Uh, and it should have brackets around it. It doesn't really matter, but I think it's easier to read that way. So what is t of f of x? It should be the same thing as f of x, but it should also be the integral from x0 up to x of f big F of t comma little f of t dt plus that initial condition y0. So by just looking at that formula, what do you get when you plug in x equals x0? Well, let's even just do it without writing. Um, so you'll end up with the integral t. Um, so f of x0 should be the same thing as t of f of x0, right, because f is supposed to be a fixed point for t. What do you get for that formula when you plug in, right, so right there is the only x in that formula. What do you get when you plug in x equals x0 to that formula? So it's 0 plus y0. Is that exactly what it should be if f solves the IDP? Awesome. which is what it needs to be if we're supposed to solve that initial value problem. The next thing that uh, f prime had better satisfy is the derivative of f prime had better be big F evaluated at x comma little f. Uh, is it? Let's write down just a little bit. So this will be, so f prime is supposed is, well f is the same thing as t of f, so that's going to be the same thing as the derivative of t of f of x. So that'll be the derivative of the integral from x0 up to x of big F of t comma f of t dt plus y0. Should that be x0 to t for? Mm, no, I do want uh, an x up there. So, I, okay. so t is like a local variable to the inside of the integral. Mm -hmm. So the whole point is like, uh, I want to integrate with respect to some variable, but I can't integrate with respect to x because x is already a parameter of the function. Yeah. So you say oh, f yeah. of okay. five. So this is all for t. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So t is just that parameter you integrate over. It doesn't matter what you call it. It's a it's a made up variable. Okay. Um, but yeah, yeah, integrating that maybe using the fundamental theorem of calculus. Well, let's look at it one piece at a time. What's the derivative of y zero with respect to x? Zero, it's a constant. What's the derivative of that integral? Uh, or little f of x. It'll be big F of x comma little f of x, right? Because that's what the fundamental theorem of calculus says. It's a complicated looking function inside of the integral, but that's okay. Uh, FTC says that d by dx 
we had to go from x0 up to x. And that's exactly what we've used. Uh, does that mean that this function little f solves that IVP? Yeah. And you'll notice that I have actively avoided specifying domains in any of these functions. I guess right now the domain is any interval which happens to contain x0. Uh, next, well, it's an if and only if, so I guess it better go the other way. Let's suppose that little f solves the IVP. And let's see if t of f is the same as f. And this is going to be another direct computation. t of f is the integral from x0 up to x of big F of t comma f of t dt plus y0. But that's just the definition of t. Um, if little f is supposed to solve this ID, this, this differential equation, then what is that integral the same as? So this should be like, this looks a lot of f. Oh, it's kind of a little f prime of t. Not the whole integral, just the integral. So what is this? Well, that looks an awful lot like that, which according to this should be f prime at whatever variable that is. So this will be the integral from x0 up to x of little f prime of t dt plus y0 is f of x0. So maybe you know one thing uh, easily, if I give you some differential equation, um, it's not automatic that that differential equation will have a solution from minus infinity to infinity. It will only have it on some little interval. So presumably I'll need to care about that at some point. And here's how I'll do it. I haven't specified this, this map t takes continuous functions to continuous functions. But let's think about, well, if you know the domain and range of that continuous function phi, you should be able to figure out the domain and range of that continuous function t of phi. Well, you probably could. And let's do exactly that. That's what this Erfost lemma is going to do. So there, there are going to be two things that we'll do. Um, uh, lemma two, the thing that we're about to do, we'll compute the domain and codomain of that operator. Sorry, it can't take an arbitrary continuous function, because what if phi of x is not something that's in the domain of big F? So we'll need to be a little bit careful. Uh, and then, once we know what its domain and codomain are, well, if you want to show its contractive, contractions, well, the definition of a contraction series, says something about how it spreads out distances. So we'll need to control what happens to distances under the map T. So those are the, the two main things that we need to do. Now let's get on. So let's suppose that f from ab cross c d to where is a continuous function, that x0 is a point in ab, y0 is a point in cd. So I'm going to forget all about differential equations 
and I'm just going to study this up later. T. Um, I'll set L to be, if you like, something like the length of the interval from A to B, but it's more like the radius of the interval from A to B if I imagine that the center is X0. So I'll set L to be the max between those two things. So I guess pictorially, if there's A, there's B, and there's X0, then there is L, the longer of the two distances from X0 to an endpoint. Uh, let's set M0 to be the maximum value of big F on the closed rectangle AB cross CD. Um, so you'll notice that I said maximum at least in walls. It says soup there, but I said maximum in walls. Is maximum an okay thing to talk about right there? Is big F a continuous function? Yeah. Is that domain compact? Yeah. So can you tell me about the codomain? Also compact. Also compact. Oh, the range is com is also compact. So that means that the range has its maximum. So it's okay to say max. We won't use that. Um, the maximum value will be achieved. Uh, let's consider the operator T defined by the rule that we're studying. I claim that that sends the set of continuous functions from the interval A B to the interval C D to the space of continuous functions from the interval a, b to the interval y0 minus big M times L comma y0 plus big M times L. So there's all that my goal was going to be for this lemma. And let's think about what that means. Um, so let's get the assumptions out of the way. Let's let big F be continuous, x0 and a, b, y0 and c, d. Set L to be the thing that we said L is. Set m0 to be the thing that we said m0 is. So what does it mean to say that big T maps that space of continuous functions to that space of continuous functions? I guess that should mean that if I take any P that's in the thing underlined in blue, then I'll get a new continuous function. And that new continuous function will send things in A, B to that long interval. So that's what I need to show. So let's just try to unpackage a little bit. So let's let phi be an element of this domain. That means that phi, well, it's a map from a comma b to c comma d. And um, I know that like we've said it a bunch of times already, but what is big C from a thing to a thing? What do I mean by that? So that means this map phi is bounded and continuous. So maybe I'll write continuous here, because that seems like the more important property. Um, and I'll also write bounded here. Um, but if phi is already a map from A, B to C, D, then is it bounded already? That second assertion is redundant. But that's okay. I need to show that T of B is in this space. So what does that mean? That means I need to show that T of B gives a continuous function from the interval A comma B to the interval Y0 minus M0 times L to Y0 plus M0 times L. <coughs> That's what I need to show. Um, and right, this map is defined by like integrating, and integration only makes functions better. So I know that this will be continuous. If you like, it'll be continuous. It'll even be differentiable by the fundamental theorem of calculus. And differentiable functions are continuous, at least if you're walking over the real line. You need like some bonus conditions if you're walking over R2, but why not? Um, I need to show that T of E gives a continuous function from A, B to Y0 minus M, L, M0, L, to Y0 plus M0 times L. That makes sense? So I guess it's pretty straightforward to see what we actually need to show. So I guess we want to show for every X in A, B, 
of phi of x is in between y0 minus m 0L and y0 plus m0 times L. That makes sense how that's, that's what we need? And now you can clearly see, oh, that's just like some inequality. I guess that just means that t of phi of x is within some bounded distance of y0. So let's, let's just try to do that. So let's consider any x in the interval from a to b. So let's just start putting things together. Um, so here's uh, the thing that we're integrating, f of t comma phi of t. Uh, that's clearly a composition of functions, right? Uh, what's it a composition of? Well, I guess first you could think of it as sending t to t comma phi of t, and then any point x, y to big F of x comma y. But if you compose those functions, you'll get big F of t comma phi of t. Do you guys buy that, or do you need to see that in detail? You want to see it in detail. You guys are very quiet today. Um, right, so it's a composition of continuous functions. And so does that mean it has to be continuous? Yeah. I mean, this happens to be a function from error to error 2. That's a function from error 2 back to error. But you saw this fact. Continuous functions, when you compose them, are continuous. So that means that f of t comma phi of t, it's also defined on a closed bounded interval. And so it is, and it's important that you reach the end of the sentence before you say what we'll go on the next blank. It is some adjective so that that integral is defined. Well, what do you think I want there? Integral. Integral. Are continuous functions integrable? Have we, I think I had you guys prove that as like a homework problem. Uniformly continuous functions are integrable? You might not have done that homework problem. Um, it's integral. I laugh at my own mistakes. So the integral exists. Everyone happy that so far? Cool. Um, okay, so what was that even just making sense of? That's I'm, I'm, all I'm getting so far is that T of E actually exists. That's an important start with, right? Uh, now let's try to control how big T of E is. So let's recall. Um, What's the definition of m0 given in the statement of the theorem? Uh, the maximum of the image of the function. Yeah, it's the maximum of the image of the function. So it's like the biggest of all of the outputs. So it's the square of all of the outputs of f of x comma y over all valid, val valid values of x comma y. Oh, in fact, there are absolute value bars around it, right? I don't think I pronounced the absolute value bars, but they're written. So, how does big F of t comma p of t compare with m0 for every choice of t? It's less than or equal to f of x comma y is always less than or equal to m0. So that has to be less than or equal to m0. Oh, wait. So that means that this is the integral of a function for which we have an explicit upper bound over an interval. If you integrate such a thing, the biggest that that could possibly be is the length of the interval times that upper bound. Nice. Uh, so you'll notice that I have there are x minus x0 and absolute values. Do you think that's important? That I could accidentally have those endpoints in the long order, right? Yeah. In which case, that thing would be negative. So yeah, you need the absolute value. OK, so now let's uh, control this some more. Um, the length from x to x0, let's draw a picture. It's going to be the, this picture again, but lower down so you can see it. So if there's a and there's b, 
and there's x0, and there's this value x. Um, the length from x to x0, like the biggest that could possibly be is the length from x0 to one of the endpoints. So that means that this length is less than or equal to the max between that distance and that distance. Do I have a name for that? No. Cool. So that means the absolute value uh, of the integral from x0 to x of big F of t comma phi of t is less than or equal to m0 times L. Uh, that has absolute value bars around it, so we can get rid of the absolute value bars. And I get that down. Uh, the thing in the middle of that inequality, is that quite, is that the definition of the operator t of phi just yet? Almost. What's it off by? Why not? <laughs> There's a good joke to be made there. Yeah. <laughs> but you may have just made it. So then you know what to do. I mean, if you want to control the operator T of E, let's just add Y0 to everything in sight. Oh, cool. But now, as you guys already told me, this is exactly T of E evaluated at x. So that means that for every x, t of phi of x is in the interval that we wanted it to be, right? It's in y0 minus m0 l to y0 comma y0 plus m0 l for every x in a, b. So phi is a function from a, b to y0 minus m0 l, y0 plus m0 l, which is what we claim. Does that complete the proof of the result? Now there's a detail missing. I mean, it's a detail that maybe I said in words out loud. So I verified that t is a function from this set to that set. But what is the definition of big C? Continuous and bounded. Continuous and bounded. Bounded will happen for fully because y0 minus ml and y0 plus ml are bounds. It needs to be continuous. But I kind of said aloud, well, across it'll be continuous. It'll even be differential. Let's differentiate. Um, we still need this to be continuous, as its codomain is y0 minus ml to y0 plus ml. It's it is, it's on, this t of phi is already a bounded function. Um, let's differentiate it to show that it's differentiable. So that'll be d by dx of the integral from x0 up to x of phi big F of t comma little f of t dt plus y0. And even though I don't really care what the derivative of this is, I just care that it has a derivative. What's the derivative of that? Like f of x. Well. Well, f of x. F of x. Yeah. 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 So I tried to follow the notation that like the function little f is going to be the function that I'm actually interested oh, in at yeah. the end of the day, the solution to the IVP. These generic functions, I'll use Greek letters phi or psi to denote. So nice. Differentiable functions are continuous, so this function is continuous. Everyone pretty happy? Any questions right now? OK, cool. So remember, if I want this to be a contraction, the domain and codomain have to line up. So right now, I have the map t 
sending continuous functions a, b to c, d sends that to the space of continuous functions to find out the interval a, b but now the codomain is y0 minus ml y0 plus ml I really give you a contraction mapping. You don't need the domain and codomain to line up on the nose, but you certainly do need the codomain to be contained in the domain again. So we are going to need that to happen. And let's think about what that means. Let's just parse it out in watts. So in order for that to happen, every continuous function from a b to this interval has to also be a continuous function from a, b to that interval. So I guess that means this interval had better be contained in that interval. That would do it, right? And if we didn't have that, then you might have a continuous function that accidentally takes values outside of here. So you wouldn't get the container you need. So what are we going to need in order for this to actually line up and have a having a, in order for it to have a prayer of being a contraction mapping, we need y0 minus m0l, y0 plus m0l to be contained in c, comma, d. What restriction does this impose on l? So I guess we can like draw a picture for some motivation. I'm going to want you guys to just do the algebra though. Uh, so that means c, comma, d is the bigger interval. y0 minus m0l, y0 plus m0l. I guess that means y0 must be smack in the middle. So in order for the red interval to be contained in the blue interval, some inequalities need to be satisfied, right? Looks like this needs to be at least as big as c. That is at most as big as d. Uh, take those inequalities and solve them for l. So let's actually check it this way. So let's look at this picture. Um, so L is supposed to be positive, right? So L can't be less than both of those things, because one of them is negative, the other one. Um, is In this picture, is Y0 bigger than C or less than C? Bigger than larger. So I think this is the one that it better be. Okay. Um, I suspect you like lost a negative sign at some point. It doesn't matter. There's another inequality, though, right? There's the one that comes from the fact that y0 plus ml has to be less than or equal to d. Oh, I used to see for both, yeah. Ah, uh -huh. aha. Yeah. Okay, so you do have one of the, like, that one's right. It's just got a c yeah. instead of a d. That's a d. d minus y0 over ml. Yeah. In fact, let's uh, just write it this way. y had better be less than or equal to the max between y0 minus c, d minus y0 all over 
and see you later. Well, I mean, right, if, if it's less than or equal to two different things, then it's going to be less than or equal to ooh, the min of those two things. Not that silly. I made that same mistake in my pre-done notes that I did to make sure things fit. Which means I bet there's going to be an error uh, in a coming proof. I don't think it'll be in the next one, because the next one I don't think that'll come up. All right, so the next thing that we need to do is we need to control what t does to the Suprema metric. If we have to prove that t is a contraction mapping, let's see what t does to the distance between uh, two functions. So same assumptions. Let's assume that f is continuous, that x0 is in a, b, the y0 is in c, d. Let's set l to be the max between x minus a0, b minus x0. So the same thing as it was before. Let's set m0 to be the maximum value of big F. Let's suppose that the partial derivative d2 f of x, y, so I guess that's differentiate with respect to the second variable y, uh, is defined for every x and y in the interval from a, b times the interval c, d, and that there's some, point, some value m1 such that the absolute value of d2 of f at every x and y is less than or equal to m1. Then the operator t from c of a, b to the operator which we know goes from here to there by lemma 2. Uh, defined by 2 satisfies that it takes the distance between t of e and t of psi, that's less than or equal to a number that we'll figure out once we know what goes there, times the the d sup from e to psi. Is that the first time I've actually had like a blank in? No, that's not the first time I've had a blank in the theorem. This is the first time I think that in this class I've had a blank in a theorem that I won't fill out until I know what the proof is. And that makes some sense, right? I mean, I'll figure out what the, what the result is, and at the same time as doing that, I'll know what the, the proof is and what the theorem is. So let's, let's do it. Um, oh, and maybe I'll make one last comment. So in there, there's this assumption that big F is like differentiable with respect to y. Not with respect to x. I don't care if it's differentiable with respect to x. Um, in fact, you don't even really need to be differentiable with respect to y. You just need to, it to satisfy this condition. That's all that I'll actually use. Um, and notice, if a function is differentiable with respect to y, then you get an inequality like this out of the mean value theorem. I guess that should be less than or equal to. Um, another thing that that's called is, well, that's something like saying that the function f is Lipschitz with respect to y. If you want to look up Lipschitz functions on your own time, go for it. There. Um, more there, there, there are class of functions that's more specific than just continuous functions, but more general than differentiable functions. They're still better behaved than just general continuous. Oh, OK, nice. So let's assume that big F is continuous. X and A, B, so all of the, the assumptions, X0 and A, B, Y0 and C, D. I'll set L to be that thing that L is, M0 to be the maximum value of big F. I'll assume that the second derivative of F is defined, sorry, the derivative of F with respect to Y is defined, and that it's bounded above by some M1. Uh, I now need to show that something happens for every phi and psi. So let's consider any phi and psi in that space of continuous functions. Let's let S be D sup of phi comma psi, just so I don't have to keep on writing d sup of phi comma psi. I'll give it a name. Um, what's the definition of d sup? Definition of distance is the absolute value of the difference. <coughs> um, 
<laughs> um, nice, but that's the supremum. So that means that this thing is bigger than or equal to every one of those things. So since we call the distance s, that means that for every x in a, b, the difference between phi of x and psi of x, the distance between them, is less than or equal to s. I need to show that the distance between t of phi and t of psi is less than or equal to something time is s. And if I want to show that, I guess that means I need to show that for every x in the interval from a to b, t of phi of x minus t of psi of x in absolute value is less than or equal to this. That would do the job. Well, that, that should probably be like less than or equal to. Well, let's do it by computer. Let's compute the difference between t of phi of x and t of psi of x. So that'll be, I'll remember the absolute value pairs, and then there will be an integral from x0 to x of big F of t comma phi of t dt plus y0, and then minus the same thing but with psi instead of phi. There should be a dt there. Everyone happy with that? Now let's just see what simplification we have. Do you see anything that cancels? Y0. Ah, so remember it will be minus all of t of phi of x. Okay. So I've distributed a minus sign. Oh, 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 okay, you had the parentheses that I didn't draw in your head. Yes. Okay, yeah, then there would be a plus sign here. Yeah. But now I can't draw those parentheses because then there would be a plus um, I also see an integral minus an integral. These are honest to God integrals, not upper integrals or lower integrals. They're honest to God integrals. So the integral of difference is equal to the difference between the integrals, whichever one of that should be. I'm going to put that, I'm going to write it as a single integral. Same thing as the absolute value of the integral from x0 up to x of big F of t comma phi of t minus big F of t comma psi of t dt absolute value. Nice. Um, there's two things. Uh, I the same things, except that they differ in what you're plugging into the second entry in big F. So according to the mean value theorem for functions of two variables, there should exist some number C, I guess I'll call it Q there, to C, some number Q between B of T and Psi of T, so that this difference is equal to the second derivative evaluated at that thing, times the difference between B of T and Psi of T. I will write what I just said. Okay. Um, so this difference will be equal to the derivative of f evaluated at t comma something that I don't know, q of t, times phi of t minus psi of t. Right, the mean value theorem says that the average rate of change at some point agrees with the instantaneous rate of change. This thing divided by that thing is an average rate of change. There's an instantaneous rate of change. Yeah. Shit. I'll that other time. <clears throat> okay, so we'll come back. Maybe for now, I'll try to motivate why this should make you very, very happy. Uh, do I have an upper bound on how big phi of t and psi, how close those two things are? Yes. Yeah, those are within s of each other. Do I have control over how big d2f is? Yes. Yes, that's what m1 is, I think. Do I have an upper bound on how big x0 minus x can be? Yes. Yes, that's l. So 
maybe dot, dot, dot. And that's less than or equal to L times M1 times S. Oh, hey, but that's L times M1 times the distance with respect to the soup norm of phi comma psi. Is that enough to tell you what is probably going, going to go in those blanks? And in fact, it tells you what the proof is from here on out, doesn't it? So uh, here, I think, is what I want you guys to do. There is some homework assigned for today. It will, I think, quite possibly be the same as the homework assigned for tomorrow. Whatever. Tomato, potato. Um, what you guys should do is figure out the remainder of this proof, and maybe even figure out how to put together the two things that we just proved to prove corollary five. Corollary five really is quick. It's just we've actually proven that T is a contraction under the right assumptions. Because once we know it's a contraction, then we know it has a fixed point. Once we know it's a fixed point, we know that this differential equation has a solution. So we'll go through the rest of this. But I want you guys to basically have it all understood first. And so then you guys can decide whether you want me to talk through the rest of the proofs, or if you want to like ask me questions about the one homework problem that I can assign. Ruby.